Hello, listeners, and welcome back to the Religious Studies Project. It is Monday morning, which means that we have a new episode for you. Well, new of sorts. I'm Andy Alexander, and joining me today is... Allison Isidore. Now, Allison, we have a remix episode lined up for today. Can you tell us what this episode will be about? Yeah, sure. So today we're going to be talking about the insider-outsider problem in the field of religious studies. We've got a lot of scholars who have been on the show before talking about this. So let's dive in. So what exactly is an insider or an outsider? Well, there's been a lot of debate about exactly what an insider or an outsider is, but basically, in theory, the insider is the person that follows the religion. The outsider is the person like me most of the time who can't belong to all the religions I study. So I'm looking at it uh, as a non-believer, as a non-practitioner. I'm trying to make sense of it. As a non-practitioner, how do you study other religious groups? Are there scholars who study their own traditions? Well, I think it's clear most of the time that I'm the outsider because uh, most of the time um, I'm trying to understand what the religion believes and why they do it and what it's based on and what all the uh, various activities are that they follow and what the reasons are for them. It's sometimes said that um, the outsider tries to make the strange familiar. Right, so it's strange to me, uh, but my job is to make it familiar, first of all, to myself, mm. um, but secondly, to the people I'm writing for or lecturing to or whatever. Uh, the other side to that is it's sometimes said that if you're the insider studying your own religion, you're trying to make the familiar strange. In other words, um, the religion that you follow seems uh, very familiar to you, but yet you don't see what's problematic about it. Yeah, I, I sometimes have said to students, and sometimes they've been surprised, I've said there's actually a sense in which we're not interested in truth. My key question is not, um, might they be teaching the truth? Uh, what my job is, is to understand them and to get them right and to make sure that I'm not misrepresenting them and uh, to raise key questions about them. Hmm. So we've got a different agenda. Uh, here I am uh, with this method of logical agnosticism, I'm not supposed to be asking the question, might they be right? But uh, from their point of view, they're saying, well, uh, there's no question about it. We are right. We've got the truth and we wish you would accept it. I think really you've got to say, well, there are outsiders that um, bring to bear certain things that the insider can't and vice versa. The insider might be over enthusiastic about their, their own religion. They may privilege their own particular tradition, but at least the insider will know what religion means. And that can be a problem if you're the outsider. There are probably some outsiders that um, aren't really very sure of why people follow a religion or for, uh, what it means to them and so on. On the other hand, they've got, um, one hopes, uh, some kind of objectivity. Can scholars be objective and removed from the discourse on religion? Scholars who also produce discourse on religion, that scholars are not and they cannot be total outsiders in these debates. Sometimes scholars are directly involved by giving expert statements or commenting in, in the media something. Um, but even, even in cases where scholars are not directly involved, they are sometimes referred to. So in that sense, you cannot be an outsider. And this is something that should be reflected on in the analysis. Now, analyzing discourse is itself a discursive practice, although it's a different kind of discursive practice. Mm. But, but nonetheless, it's, it's part of the field. How do some scholars study and represent insiders? I do think it's incumbent on people who study religion, not from theology, but from a sociology religion point of view, 
to try and be as as truthful as possible in their representation of what they're studying. I do hold on very much to that. I think there is something in that almost enlightenment ideal, although I would qualify it by saying that I think the truth is relative to particular contexts. And so in some situations, when you're representing religion truthfully, you may have to become its advocate. If, if, if the audience is particularly hostile, you know, irrationally hostile to religion, you may have to try and represent, this isn't trivial, this isn't important, and go in that direction and be a caretaker in that sense, I suppose. But then on the other hand, if you're trying to represent religion to a group that's, that's very deeply committed to something itself, you, you may have to, you may be very critical, you may have to point out things they don't want to see about it, like the way it ties in with particular group interests or marks particular gender roles or things that aren't necessarily particularly palatable to say. So I think you're in this position always of having to monitor who you're representing the truth to and in, in what ways. And as a scholar, you stand, you're constantly moving between two communities. You you try and absolutely enter into the worlds of the religions that you're representing and be as empathetic as you can be. But then you're cycling out back into the world of a scholar, asking different questions. And, and, you, ha- and you have a very strong commitment to the criteria of your and protocols of your own discipline. So you're living between these two worlds the whole time. I think that the testimony of believers is evidence with which scholars pursue their work. I grant no particular privilege to the testimony of those who are committed to a given fate of one sort or another. I think we owe them the respect one owes to every human being. And that is of of a serious conversation. But we can't just mediate and represent this is what these people believe. They don't need us to do that. But I think much of the work that takes place in religious studies is of the form of this is Buddhist doctrine. This is Catholic doctrine. These are the things people of whatever faiths say and believe. And the intervention of the scholar is mostly to just make it accessible to a different kind of audience and to treat it very respectfully. And if he or she adds something, it's simply to say, gee, it's really deep and profound and beautiful. You, you may not want to buy into it, but you have to love it because it's, it's got all these truths embedded in it. And how do we use these terms and talk about these groups in a way that is both respectful and academically productive? We can't get away from the terms, whether it's religion or Hindu or Buddhist or whatever. We can't get away from them because people are using them as identifiers, using them to identify other people. But too often we use them as if there's some real essence out there Mm -hmm. that we assume we can get to, whether we use the term or not, without seeing the term as a political choice that people are making when they self-identify or identify others. Well, and by extension, Stephen, I think then that we privilege and authenticate and legitimize an insider or participant viewpoint as some kind of authentic <coughs> definition or, or, or thing. So, so if you call yourself this, then that this becomes real for me because I'm the scholar going to respect the way that you talk about this thing that you're doing because you're the one who's really doing it. You're the one who really has some kind of expertise or authority to talk about it. And it's often a very particular form of the discourse of what Hinduism is that we authorize as the real Hindus. I've had people talking about some of my work on Sindhi Hindus saying, well, they may say they're Hindu, but, and this is a scholarly peer review, but they may be wrong about what they are. (laughs) Because there's a particular definition of Hinduism and separation between Hinduism and Sikhism that has become the dominant discourse and that just gets naturalized. So what is the benefit then of studying these discourses? It's not difficult to find the media and scholarship filled with debates currently on what type of Islam is the proper type. Those debates are themselves the object of study for a critic, a culture critic, by which I meant and by which I continue to mean someone who's interested in studying the mechanisms whereby systems of dominance, marginalization, systems by which power is articulated, negotiated, to understand how those systems work, how they function, how they last over time, how what might be understood as happenstance gets portrayed as necessity, inevitability. So thus we end up talking about things like naturalization. That's the work of the culture critic, to understand how these mechanisms work, to provide examples of how they work. Uh, As such, for such a scholar, uh, we're not studying religion. 
right? That should be obvious. We're using those institutions called religion as, and here I'm just boring on Jonathan Smith's widely well-received work. Um, we're just using them as EGs, as examples of instances of wider sets of processes that we're interested in, things we've seen elsewhere before in other cultural practices. If we aren't studying religion, what can we learn from studying insider, outsider discourses about religion? I think society is a project rather than an entity that exists by nature. I think humans you know, come to associate with one another and learn how to deal with one another and develop identities that bind them to some people and distance them from others through really complicated processes. And a big part of that takes place at the level of the discourses they're exposed to. I'm, I'm interested in the formation of society, the moments society falls apart and has to be restored, society's capacity for reproducing itself over time. And I'm particularly interested in the way the stories people tell themselves about themselves, the stories they tell about their neighbors close and you know, further afield. The stories they tell themselves about their past and the foundation, the hopes they come to cultivate, the ideal image they they develop of themselves and what they aspire toward, um, the practices at the level of etiquette and ritual and ceremony and memorial that they come to repeat and, and to treasure and to cultivate. Uh, how those sorts of instruments let them constantly recreate the social. And I'm particularly interested in the moments of conflict when the fissures and the cleavages and the contradictions that are always there in any social group prove unmanageable and the whole project threatens to break down or, or explode. You put humans in groups and they will immediately develop in-group bias and out-group bias. How are those in-group biases and out-group biases produced? There are bodies in the world that have dispositions towards viewing other groups negatively. How are those produced? Well, in part, they're produced through the propaganda that they consume. It, you can't have groups without discourses that bring those groups into existence. And once they exist, those bodies in those groups have positive and negative intuitions about others in the world. So if we want to understand why do people have positive gut reactions or negative gut reactions in their bodies with their emotions, we can't account for that without in part taking account of the discourses that build the communities or uh, social groups that they reside in. Thanks, Allison, for putting together this excellent remix episode about the insider-outsider problem in the study of religion. In addition to the audio recording of this episode, we also have a video episode on our YouTube channel of the remix that we've designed ideally for in-class use for anyone who's interested in talking about the insider-outsider problem in their introductory to religious studies class or wherever you might be discussing this. We hope this video will be very useful for you. So please head over to our website at religiousstudiesproject.com where you can find the page for this episode and a link to our YouTube page as well. And we hope that this video will be helpful for you. If you've enjoyed this video or other remix episodes, please let us know what sort of questions you would like to see in future remix episodes. We would love to hear your feedback and we look forward to making more of these in the future. Of course, as always, we appreciate any support you can give, whether it's liking, commenting, and sharing on our posts on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. Or if you can, sign up for a monthly donation for as little as $1 a month at patreon.com slash project RS or giving us a one-time donation via PayPal. Next week, we have another discourse episode lined up for us. So I can't wait to see what we have in store. And until next time, all that's left to say is thanks, thanks for, for listening. listening. The RSP is sponsored by the BASR, NAASR and the IAHR and is produced by the Religious Studies Project Association, a Scottish charitable incorporated organisation. Find out more at religiousstudiesproject.com. 
Brought to you by editors Andy Alexander and David McConaughey and founding editors Chris Cotter and David Robertson. Our features are edited by Savannah Finver and our opportunities digest by Ella Bach. Audio editing by Alex Matthews. Video editing by Alison Isidore. Podcast transcription by Jaden Bartasius. And social media managed by Candice Mixon. Don't forget, you can support the project by using our Amazon.com, .co.uk and .ca links or donating at patreon.com backslash projectrs. And you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, iTunes and all other portals. Thanks for listening.